This week on the Faculty Factory Podcast. To your point, to come back to any local institution with great ideas that I think are founded in data and business savvy, because, you know, this is at the end of the day, I'm a I'm a finance person. And I think in terms of ROI, and there's plenty of data now around ROI and, and harnessing the talent of a diverse workforce. With all that being said, though, institutions, local institutions move slowly. And so I think I have learned and to appreciate the tincture of time, as well as having that national level of engagement does two things. I think for all of our faculty, it does add gravitas. It may not be something that comes up every day or every week or every month, but when a conversation about one's area of national expertise does bubble up, I think it is very helpful, particularly as a system leader. I'm a, I have a VP level role in my health system. It is very helpful to be informed about national level trends and best practices. The other piece about national level engagement that I want to make sure I emphasize personal development and sense of community because I have gotten so much out of my connect personally out of um, uh, my connections with my like-minded colleagues nationally in SGM and now in the AAMC. And that's both through GWIM, the Group on Women in Medicine Science, and through the Group of Fa- on Faculty Affairs. So even if local pace of change is slow and at times frustrating, it's so comforting to have that community of colleagues elsewhere who can be supportive and positive. I've never heard that phrase, tincture of time, and I'm going to take that to heart. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. On today's episode, we have Dr. Amy Gottlieb. Dr. Gottlieb is the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Bay State, and the Chief Faculty Development Officer at Bay State Health. She is also a Professor of Medicine in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Welcome to the podcast, Amy. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, Kim. Well, we're really looking forward to your the conversation with you today. I know you are really active in the Double AMC Group on Faculty Affairs sister, I'll call you the sister affinity group, the G Wims group, the group on women in medicine and science. And I know you've been, uh, had a leadership role there for a while. You're on the steering committee and we recently partnered in a conference. So it's always great to talk to our colleagues in other affinity groups because we have obviously overlapping interests. And so maybe would you like to um, do a little bit of a a historical journey on how you got into faculty affairs for us? I think people love hearing these stories and wondering how a obstetrics and gynecology professor um, ends up in faculty affairs. Yes, yes. So I um so I would love to tell you a little bit about my my circuitous journey, I think, to academic medicine writ large and then also to the uh, roles I play now in supporting the advancement of women in medicine. So I um I actually started out my professional life at in corporate finance, so totally unrelated to medicine, and I've always been very passionate about about helping underserved women, and whether that be uh, in in uh, service work or in um, in healthcare or in professional advancement, and so I, when I entered medicine, I was still reading the business literature very avidly, and I noticed probably about a decade ago, that there was a lot of talk in the business literature about tapping the unused talent of women and some levers to do that, most namely this new concept at the time called sponsorship. So that kind of, I guess, almost intellectual journey paralleled my my, uh, trajectory within academic medicine. I was at Brown for about 16 years, 
And on faculty there did a lot of medical education leadership around women's health and started to get more and more interested in the faculty development side of gender-based advocacy. And so in 2000. 12, I, through my professional society, the Society of General Internal Medicine, had the opportunity to establish a nationwide sponsorship initiative, which was really my first big jump into faculty development and the faculty affairs world because the goal of the career advising program, which still exists today and has served over 300 uh, faculty across the country, so the goal of CAP was to support the advancement of female junior faculty, particularly around academic promotion. And so I, I kind of got the bug, so to speak, in, in my experience with, with CAP and was able to get more and more involved nationally, particularly with the AAMC. And you mentioned the group of women in medicine and science. And I think my, my work in sponsorship uh, through the Society of General, General Internal Medicine is what served as um, kind of a platform to to engage more with GWIMS and the AAMC and now GFA. So in 2015, I was recruited to help um, uh, build a new academic platform at UMass Medical School's first regional campus, which is UMass Medical School Bay State. And in that, in that role, I was really tasked with envisioning and developing, uh, the, 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 the platform and the infrastructure to, uh, to support initiatives around academic appointment and promotion, uh, professional development, uh, and, and diversity. And so that's where I find myself today, four years down the road, we now have a, a fully, uh, rough, r- a fully fledged and, and smoothly running regional campus with 650 faculty and an office of faculty affairs with um, policies, procedures, and fully trained um, staff. And uh, it's really exciting to to also be able to bring some of my leadership development and professional development work to this this environment um, where the uh, the faculty are so eager to to be involved in in those endeavors. Absolutely fascinating. The background in corporate finance. Who knew? You were the first person I've ever met in academic medicine in this space who came through corporate finance. And I think it's just really a great example of diversity of frameworks and diversity of background and how that really lends to creativity. And the fact that you said you're, you were avidly reading the business literature. I, I love, I, I also appreciate trying to see what's happening in corporate America and how we can get ideas from other um, fields. So I think that is just amazing. I'm, I'm really curious about your experience back in 2012 with S. Jim. How in the world, yes. how did this, you know, you talked about how you were recruited to envision and develop. So you clearly have that gift of seeing need and developing uh-huh. program, the CAP program, the National Sponsorship Initiative. But how did you... Uh, How did you see that or identify that need? How did that come about? Was this on some kind of committee work or had you read some literature? Were you involved in some task force that said, all right, you know, oh boy, if only we had this, a career advancement program. And then you said, I'll take it on. Or was this your, did you, was the genesis from your um, thought process? Can you describe how that evolved? Sure, and that's a great question, and I would say it was multifaceted. Uh, number one is I uh, have, have um, as I mentioned, been reading the business literature for so many decades, and there was consistent conversation about the paucity of women in leadership in, in corporate America. And, and then as I went through medical school and residency and started to read the literature, the academic medicine literature, there was, there was similar talk about the paucity of women in leadership in our field. And you probably know these data as well as most of your audience that 
Nationally, per the AAMC data, only 25% of professors are women, only 18% of department chairs are women, and that's in, that's 2018 data. And, and so, and, and things were, looked worse in 2012. And so I think the, the, um, the terrain was kind of ripe for, for some innovation around how can we harness the talent of our, our diverse workforce, and in particular, our women who at that point, and certainly now, represent at least half of our, of our pipeline for, for Madison. So, so that combined with, I have to tell you, a real um, kind of personal experience I had when I was going up for promotion to associate professor, I learned, and I think a lot of junior faculty learn this right at the point of going up for um, for promotion that there was this whole concept of of uh, letters of evaluation or letters of reference mm-hmm. and how those those letters are so important for the peer review process locally but really draw upon one's network professionally nationally and I felt again that, my work within the Society of General Internal Medicine, which had allowed me the opportunity to engage with individuals at institutions all over the country, provided me the ability to have had some exposure in my in my professional areas of interest. But but in many ways, that was a little bit, it wasn't very transparent, that process. And I know those of us in faculty affairs talk a lot about this, about there's such an importance around academic strategic planning and making our junior faculty aware of all the uh, processes that have to take place in order them, for them to advance. And so what I thought to myself was, wow, if we could just help women, junior faculty, not only understand this process, but give them some support to build those professional networks, um, we could really make a difference. And that really is sponsorship, if you think about it. Uh, the, the CAP program has very, and this was intentional from the get-go, has very intentional expectations for the advisors who are really the sponsors. And that is about um, helping their advisees or in, in sponsorship lingo, protégés, to, to build networks, to, um, to get on high impact committees, to enhance their CVs, all with an eye towards um, kind of the sponsor's role in, in, um, in expanding the reach of a, of a talented protege. And, and so I think the combination of understanding the terrain and the data and the, and the innovation in, in the business world and the need in medicine writ large and my own experience really uh, coalesce to help uh, help me develop an established cap. Now, what kind of, um, what was the political climate in the Society of General Internal Medicine at that time? And then at uh, Brown, when you were there, I'm wondering if you came upon uh, any kind of pushback or reticence to devote time, resources, staff to put this together. How do you recall barriers or hurdles in, in building this kind of a endeavor? How did, how did this happen? So again, that's a great question. And, and I can say no, not at all. I mean, I, so, so the other piece of this is that my ability to, I think, bring the idea of CAT to leadership very much rested on on my the fact that I at the time was a very active member of the Society of General Internal Medicine's Women in Medicine Task Force, and I ultimately ended up chairing that group, which was a very active uh, and well regarded uh, committee within the society. And so, even though a lot of, in fact, ninety nine percent of the effort was volunteer in terms of the creating the program and and um, and and the infrastructure and doing the matches, uh, the volunteer work on my part and colleagues of mine on the Women in Medicine Task Force, SGEMS, uh, from SGEMS perspective, the staff were incredibly supportive. And I think that SGEM, along with, um, I'll certainly say many other 
other professional societies I've engaged with and organizations really do hold that this that the the, the gender equity piece and advancement uh, of of leaders within academic medicine is a critical issue to understand and address and there aren't really a lot of levers yet that have been deployed within academic medicine and so I think SGM was um was as I said very supportive because this was a potential solution not just let's name the problem well, th- this is fascinating to me because I think we have this, these conversations with our faculty when we talk about impact. And you mentioned going up for promotion. And I see a thread through this story in that oftentimes at our local institutions, we may not be recognized or a faculty may not be recognized or appreciated for the impact they're having in their field or in their area of research or, or study. And what you've demonstrated is that uh, this, an opportunity of going to your professional society mm-hmm. and having impact there on a national level yeah. demonstrates, the, you know, your, your, your scholarship and demonstrates your carving out this niche and, and growing a field and building and building a science toward some uh, goal. And yet I'm wondering how that connected back then to your faculty appointment as a professor, associate professor at Brown. So in other words, uh, when we tell our faculty, you have to have a national impact, you have to have international yep. uh, impact. And the the local institution may say, well, good for you. I'm glad you're making that national impact, but what are you doing here at home? So right. it's kind of a two-edged sword that sometimes those of us in faculty or affairs or faculty development will say, well, it's great. I'm glad you you have all these friends and colleagues nationally, but what have you done for us lately? So how do you, right. not only did you personally uh, bridge that gap between national program and local impact as a as a faculty member yourself, but then what do you tell junior faculty members or mid career anybody faculty members? How can you mm-hmm. bridge those worlds so that you're not viewed as being uh, you have don't have enough presence or impact here at your home institution? Right, and I think that's a really good question. And so, so when I was at Brown, I got I became very engaged with faculty development on on campus and the group on the office of women in medicine and science at brown i was a uh, uh, an appointed member for almost a decade and so did very much try to bring my i guess national level expertise home to my local institution and did a lot of mentorship uh, work. I, I, um, this is a slightly tangential endeavor, but I also helped run a very large organization called Mom Doc Family, which was um, an organization for women physicians in southern New England, most of whom were on faculty at Brown, although now they're like 500 women. I think it's much more expanded. Uh, to looking at um, ways to support women physicians who are parents. And so a lot of my work, and it's interesting because this is really how I, I think, got very involved in the faculty development and faculty affairs leadership space was my my work through the Society of General Internal Medicine informed my local uh, endeavors, which then led to leadership roles locally and, and nationally. And I actually tell my, so now my constituency is 650 faculty. And as you probably do, I, I, I work with individual faculty members around academic strategic planning as well as large groups. And I always have the same mantra, which is your one's professional society can serve so many benefits. Uh, for an individual in terms of building communities, a community of, of colleagues, networks for, um, for professional advancement, and also sources of inspiration for local impact. And I don't think it has to be unidirectional. It's bidirectional. And in my case, I think what you've landed on is that, so I am a general internist by training. And even though I'm a general internist, I was um, employed by the Department of OBGYN while I was at Brown my whole time. And so I really had to 
um, think broadly about my academic advancement because within my department, um, uh, who, which was wonderful, uh, and I, I had a somewhat of a limited career trajectory because as a general internist, I could only have so many leadership roles within OBGYN. Mm. And so, so Society of Gen, because I am a professor of medicine and OBGYN, but my primary appointment has to be in medicine because that's how I'm trained. And so my professional society really provide, rounded out my, my interests and my initiatives and my, and informed my passions mm-hmm. because I needed to have that broad community to do so. And, and I, what I like about this is, and I would love to hear more about this component, but when you talk about your mantra of the importance of our professional societies for building community and networking and inspiration, I imagine that many people who, you know, we go to, we participate in our professional societies and our conferences and we do, we do, many of us do monthly conference calls and committee work. So we, we are kind of, we are in this leadership space of, of, What's coming around the bend? What's brand new? What are the national, what's the national, you know, tenor and tone of things? And then sometimes the struggle is to go back to our home institutions where yeah. we have to put on that hat and that, that awareness or mindfulness that we may know these things are important or pressing or, um, hot button issues and things to be, uh, watching and yet that message hasn't quite filtered down to our local institutions because they're right. busy doing their things and in their space. So I personally experience and see my faculty experience this some level of frustration like they don't get it. They don't understand why we have to fund this and that or put resources right. behind this initiative or this tool or this mechanism or this center. So there's that that how do you balance that, that heightened, um, I'm trying to, I guess what I'm trying to say, the, 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 the importance that we see something like, oh my gosh, you know, the sky is falling, sky is falling, not that we're alarmist like that, but then trying to communicate that rationally, strategically, and almost like slowing the brakes on a train. And I'm imagining the professional societies is where you get the inspiration and perhaps the the coaching and and peer mentoring from your peers to say, listen, I I'm having a tough time selling this at my local institution. They they're you know almost patting me on the head. Oh, I'm glad you're interested in the national, but we don't need that here. That's not a problem for us here, or we don't have the kind of budget to do that here. So how do you uh, coach faculty, and how have how did you think about that idea of okay, Amy? I have to kind of back this train up a bit. Uh, I have to recognize that my institution is not uh, on par or on pace with some of these things. I think that is such a fantastic question. And I have to be honest with you, it is something that I, I, I think about a lot, um, not only for my faculty, but also for myself. And I think that institutions, you know, if, if I've learned, if I've learned one thing over my 20 years uh, in academic medicine, it is, it is that institution, tincture of time, tincture of time, and institutions, um, I think, move very slowly. I, I do think that they bend towards justice. I, 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 I want to believe that in academic medicine. And so you're so right, Kim. I, because of my uh, my work with SGM, and quite honestly, now I do a lot of work with the AAMC. And as I mentioned, that my work with SGM, and particularly my work around um, uh, with professional societies and sponsorship, catapulted me, I think, into uh, the AAMC world. And the AAMC spends so much wonderful energy on issues that I'm passionate about around diversity and equity, and and then. To your point, you know, to come back to any local institution with great ideas that I think are founded in data and business savvy, because, you know, this is at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a finance person. And I think in terms of ROI, and there's plenty of data now around ROI 
and, and harnessing the talent of a diverse workforce. With all that being said, though, institutions, local institutions move slowly. And so I think um, that I have learned and to appreciate the tincture of time, as well as having that national level of engagement does two things. I think for all of our faculty, it does add gravitas. It may not be something that comes up every day or every week or every month, but but when um, a, a conversation about one's area of national expertise does bubble up, I think it is very helpful, particularly as a system leader. Um, I'm a, I have a VP level role in my health system. It is very helpful to be informed about um, national level trends and best practices. The other piece about national level engagement that I don't, that I want to make sure I emphasize is personal, um, uh, personal development and sense of community because I have gotten so much out of my connect personally, out of um, uh, my connections with my like-minded colleagues nationally in SGM and now in the AAMC, and that's both through GWIM, the Group on Women in Medicine Science, and through the Group of Fa- on Faculty Affairs. So even if local pace of change is slow and at times frustrating, it's so comforting to have that community of colleagues elsewhere who can be supportive and positive. Well, that is so well said. I love, I've never heard that phrase, tincture of time. And I'm going to take that to heart because this, you've hit on something that is just so important. That's why I love this podcast community that we all uh, experience just in our jobs. It's a lot of frustration. Dan Shapiro, uh, Penn State on the podcast said, I'm confused every day. And it's, it is a hard, it's a hard job and it's frustrating and you never feel like you're doing enough. And just yeah. knowing that there are people out there who are with us and can just give you a, you know, an electronic hug over the, 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 the email wave yeah. saying, I got you. I understand. And remembering that tincture of time. Um, I, I, I love that. And I also think you've made another important point that just, reassures me even more that we, GFA and GWIMS, need to partner with the GBA, the Group on Business Affairs. We need to have a conference where we all learn from each other. And I think it's becoming, you know, even more imperative that we have to get our business folks sitting at the same table at the same conferences. Um, It just certainly hearing you talk, I'm sure you'd be all over that. Oh yes, and in fact, I've had um, I've had many conversations over the last couple of years with colleagues at the AAMC about this, and 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 everybody is very excited, and I think it's just a logistical uh, effort to make this happen because so so certainly from a faculty affairs and a gender equity vantage point, the confluence of the business side of the house with what we have embraced as our mission missions is 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 so significant i think about um the work i've done and and i'm doing now in salary equity is such a natural marriage of the, all of those mission areas and it is uh i think also reflective of the changing landscape within healthcare where the the folks who are on the finance side are really the ones who are who are um, making the decisions that are impacting our faculty and our academic footprints. You are so so right. I, I really think the time is ripe. So everybody out there listening to this podcast, let's try to plant some seeds and look for opportunities to uh, invite our finance colleagues, our business colleagues, not only nationally, but even at our local institutions, look look for opportunities to invite them to sit at the table. You know, we have advisors mm-hmm. here at Hopkins. We have advisory councils in our Office of Faculty Development. We have junior faculty advisory councils, senior faculty. We, of course, have faculty senate. And none of those opportunities do we have our business folks sitting there. Really, you know, we're not taking right. advantage of of um, that. And, and there's just such incredible uh, tension Right now, and I think every both sides would 
be well served to, to hear each other's concerns and educate each other and inform each other on on issues that are, are driving us and um, keeping people awake at night. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Now, Amy, I would, I'm really interested and, and curious what you think about this. I hear all the time still, uh, you know, many of us have women's programs and women's leadership programs abound locally and nationally. And I have always struggled. It's like a periodic ebb and flow of should we have programs just for men we have co-ed programs uh, at Hopkins, and I know other places also have co-ed programs, but we have all these things for women. We talk about, you know, salary equity for women, women in medicine, women's leadership programs. At what point do, and then in, inevitably during all of our leadership programs for women every year, we have these rich conversations and they're such a safe place and the women really bond and they're so open and authentic. But inevitably, every time someone says, well, where are the men? The men need to be here and hearing these things. We can't make progress right. alone. We don't work in isolation. How come the men aren't here? And we, we go back and forth in this waltz of appreciating the value of programs just for women and yet thinking, are we losing opportunities that the men with whom we work aren't sitting here and hearing and engaging in these same conversations? Where do you land on the idea of at what point do we have leadership programs just for men? Or, you know, when when do we uh, invite more men to sit at this table? And is that already happening? And maybe I'm just, you know, we're overthinking this. I think it's a great question, and I don't think we're overthinking it. And I think that your timing is great because um, this is there. There's more and more conversation about allyship, which is the concept I think that you're getting at, and particularly we need that male allyship to address what I think um, uh, is the 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 biggest elephant in the room for that's uh, for. Uh, uh, serving as an obstacle for for women's advancement into into significant leadership roles, and that is what uh, some folks call second generation gender bias or implicit bias. But it's essentially um, a, a, an implicit background identity for women leaders that that limits their success and upward mo- upward mobility through um, you know gendered career paths and great having being assigned. Um, you know, more non-promotable tasks and having double binds or penalties when they behave like a traditional leader, um, you know, decisive, assertive, and independent. When women, the kind of social expectation is for them to be nice and caretaking and other focused. And all of these elements of second generation gender bias are, I think, are are significant and and have to be addressed collectively because we can't you know the 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 marginalized person can, it cannot cannot make those changes alone this is culture change right. and and so so to your point um and and those who write about allyship um it, in my estimation it's getting everybody to pay attention to um to aspects of our culture that that perpetuate this implicit bias or this implicit burden quite honestly that women leaders have to take on every day of their lives and and so so some of the and you you probably have read about this as of I some of the wonderful ways in which we can engage our men is to is to talk with them about ways we can we can help ourselves take a pause around the language that we use when we describe women and women leaders. You know, as you probably know, there's data that um, women tend to be referred to professional women, women in academic medicine get to be tend to be referred to by their first name, whereas men as doctor. Um, paying attention to who's being assigned citizen tasks, citizenship tasks. Um, who's being tapped for roles that are promotable. So one of the areas that I'm very interested in is that uh, both in the business community and in healthcare, women uh, tend to, to 
advance in supportive or kind of narrow expertise types of leadership activities versus activities that have budgetary responsibility. So being an associate dean for faculty affairs is a classic example. And there's data um, that was published in Academic Medicine about a year ago showing that the majority of positions of for like ours are in fact held by women. And and so we, I think, need collectively to think about why is it that women are kind of channeled into those roles that are not, quote unquote, batter up positions mm. for really senior leadership. So I'm talking about, you know, deans on the one side and CEOs on the other. And and so getting our male colleagues to participate in that kind of um, paying attention is, I think, the 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 the, the silver bullet that we're going to need to really change this culture of, of implicit gender bias. Mm-hmm. Do you have hope that the younger generations coming down the pipeline have been paying attention to this and have grown up in a different culture and different expectations, including language? Do you? see this happening or do you think it's it's so insidious that even um that by the time they make their way through the system that the younger generations uh will perhaps have reverted to fitting into the standardized norms and expectations of behavior well you know i hope for the best and plan for the worst i i i would hope that um <laughs> that 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 as the generations, um, the younger generations become more more involved in the leadership of our field, that um, some of these implicit biases will abate. However, the little bit of data that I have seen on this is not so heartening. And in terms of how um, how trainees evaluate faculty, for example, is gendered. Mm-hmm. And so I think that we have to do what we do best in medicine, which is to model for the younger generations how to um, how to behave in a gender inclusive way. And um, and that starts with, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, language and um and and volunteerism and expectations around all of those and sponsorship mm-hmm. because just to circle back to um to our original conversation i really believe that sponsorship is a significant lever to address second generation uh gender bias because what sponsorship does, so, and I'm, I'm talking about formal, intentional sponsorship because the data is overwhelmingly consistent that when sponsorship happens organically, whether it's in the business community or in the medical community, it tends to benefit white men. So intentional sponsorship or formal sponsorship has the ability to make merit visible so it can be rewarded and to operationalize the value of equal opportunity within an organizational culture. And I think that is really the antidote to this kind of second generation gender bias that we're experiencing. Now, in your CAP program, you said, you know, you have over 300 women now who have experienced and gone through this program as protégés. So to your point, does the CAP program train the sponsors? So I'm thinking of some leadership programs in which I've participated at various institutions where I've worked as a faculty member, and many of them you know, require a sponsor or you'll be meeting with someone who has nominated you and you meet with that person. But none of those, to my knowledge, none of those leadership programs in which I participated, to my knowledge, were the sponsors or the mentors or those leaders trained in these things of, you know, language and implicit bias and an implicit burden. And so I'm wondering if, um, if the CAP program does that, if you have, uh, looked at the effect of sponsorship on those protégés. And if not, how do we, uh, engage training of sponsors? 
Right. So, so all great questions. So specifically about cats. So from the get go, we did, um, we, uh, when I was in the leadership and now the, um, it's been since 2012. So there are new leaders, actually, um, several leaders of, of the program, but all of us devoted significant time to the point that you're making, which is when individuals volunteered to be sponsors. And so for that, I just want to be clear for CAP, the sponsors can be men or women. They just have to be senior faculty within the Society of General Internal Medicine. The protégés are all by definition women um, who are junior faculty. So we, the leaders of CAP over the years, have always been very intentional about about teaching sponsors what what sponsorship is. And early on in the program, it was with articles that, you know, there weren't a whole lot of articles back then. They were mostly from the business community. And now through... uh, annual gatherings at the at the um, at SGM's annual meeting. There's always a, a, a discussion and a training session uh, for all participants because uh, this, the, it's important to know what sponsorship behavior looks like, but it's also important for the proteges to know what their behavior should look like. And and so I, I abs- for, so for CAP, absolutely, there is some training for for both cohorts. In general, I would say, you know, you're absolutely right. I do a lot of this um, uh, work and have spoken a lot nationally and locally about what it means to be a sponsor and how one has to be very intentional around that. And I think that there's always room for more discussion because if we were to do this right as a profession, it would really be the um, an everyday habit. In fact, when I give talks on sponsorship, I, I often put up the quote um, or the anecdote, you, which you may have heard of, which is, you know, two fish are swimming and two older fish are swimming and a young fish uh, swims by and one of the older fish says, how's the water? And the young fish says, what water? Right. Um, and, uh, and that's really my goal would be that all of us are thinking about every day how can we sponsor someone uh, to um, to to advance, whether that be a stretch assignment, a membership on a high impact committee, um, an introduction to someone in his or her field? How can we do that for each other? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and particularly, I like how you brought attention to these promotable roles and being aware of women offering women opportunities and I'll say in air quotes offering them opportunities that are frequently the uncompensated roles that don't have a title that don't have any resources and um that don't move into promotable roles so that just heightened awareness is yeah. just probably a win just there it is and I also think you know this is something that I'm just starting to talk more and more about um uh, a group of us are giving actually a session at, at the WMC's annual conference on learn, which is called Learn, Serve, Lead. Uh, three, uh, 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 Dean Terry Flott, who is the dean at UMass Medical School, myself and Dr. Rene Navarro from UCSF are, are giving a talk on, um, on how to advance, what organizations can do to advance women into senior leadership roles. Because I really do believe this is an organizational effort. This is not an individual an individual uh, challenge. It is something that systems have to put in place and uh, to address. And your point about non-promotable task is a, is, a, is a real one. There's so much data around how women not only are assigned, but are expected to volunteer for, for these citizens, citizenship roles that don't lead to advancement or, to, um, or to, quite honestly, to compensation. Right. And so, so we as organizations have to be mindful about coming up with ways to spread that, to, inter- to, to evenly distribute really vital and important organizational uh, um, uh, uh, duties. But it shouldn't fall on the women. Right. And not only does it... Um do they probably tend not to lead to these promotable roles? They also impede progress in scholarly productivity 
and writing Absolutely. papers and building a research lab or or a networking or the so it does it's a significant uh commitment of time that not only may not result in anything good, but maybe a deterrent to doing other things and lead to burnout because you're just working so hard. Um, I was going to ask you Absolutely. something else. Um, oh, your awareness and your, you know, having your finger on the pulse of b- finance and the business world is, you know, making me think, well, wh- what in our society have, where have we seen or witnessed a, an obvious uptick in the presence of women in leadership roles. And I can't help but notice uh, nationally in the political landscape that it seems to yeah. me, without having data or reading any of this, that women have just sprung up uh, the past few years from out of everywhere. And I, and to me, that's where this, I've seen the most obvious uptick in, in, in women taking leadership roles or competing for leadership roles Do you have any sense of the uh, contribution of allyship, as you said, or sponsorship? Or is there any idea of how this has come about? And is there something we can learn from the political sphere of how women are um, stepping up or being allowed or given opportunities to step up? Any sense of... um, Wow, that is such an interesting question. I actually had not thought about sponsorship within the political realm. I, I have thought, though, about so, – so, so as you may know, culture change, whether it's in an organization or in a, in a society writ large, has multiple drivers. And one of the drivers is a constant conversation. And, and so what my, my take when I'm, you know, driving in my car and listening to the news and seeing this field of women, although it could be bigger, um, is that we are finally reaping the rewards of, I think, just an evolving, exploding conversation around gender and gender discrimination and gender bias. In, um, in our, in our, in our world, um, certainly in this country, and that the, one of the wonderful results of that is that women are coming forward to run for political office. And, um, I, you know, again, hope for the best, expect the worst. I really do hope that, um, we are going to see some just wonderful women leaders elected in the next year, uh, to, to run this country. It's, it's really, it's so complex and just so fascinating to me how, how things change and how the time at which and the patience it requires. And then it's reminding me, I've been reading, uh, David Brooks, The Road to Character, and I think it's in that one, or maybe Michael Lewis's, um, Oh, I can't remember what's who said this quote, but that it's something about it's not our obligation to complete the task. We are, however, required to begin it. And so that yeah, something that we know it kind of gave me some solace to know that you know, Kim, it's not on you to to figure the whole thing out and fix everything, but you know, Dad Gum, it's on you to make a contribution to build, and isn't that what we all do? I guess in science that we we build on the shoulders of our predecessors and we we are compelled to move forward. We may not see the end of it. We may not be uh, tasked at this point of our life to cure it, fix it, uh, create it, but we certainly um, are obligated to contribute to that end. And so that does give me some, and I think you kind of said the same thing that you know, we, we ultimately will bend toward justice. It just takes time and that we have to trust and have faith that that we are planting seeds and and tilling the soil to create some, you know, good good spot where something's gonna take root and will um ultimately end in good. Right? <laughs> right. And and I, I agree and I think that the work for us is is to use your word is patience. And that's Sometimes um, change, positive change, can be frustratingly slow. But again, one of the um, 
many benefits of the GFA and GWINS and the AAMC uh, is, uh, is that we are surrounded by a community of folks who are, who are uh, working alongside of us for this change. And kind of, I think for me, really feed my soul because sometimes um, uh, souls need that. You are just... Uh... Uh, incredible. I mean, everybody in the University of Massachusetts and Bay State are just so fortunate to have you. And I wonder if they even know how great you are. And the, that's when one thing I hope everybody listening understands that uh, the, the work we do is just really so important and take um, comfort in the fact that you have allies and friends around the country, around North America, who are who get this, who understand it, and who are walking alongside us in this, um, in our journey. So this is, just, Amy, you have just really, um, gosh, so much really inspiring conversation. And I've really learned a lot from you. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can go forward. I, I would love to collaborate with GBA and but your work in mm-hmm. sponsorship. I, I really do believe that we are going to kind of get there. And people like you at the helm, I have, I just feel a lot better knowing that you're out there pushing this, uh, pushing this initiative. Thank you. Is there something else you'd like to um, leave with us as we wrap up our time together today, Amy? I, um, I just want to say thank you again, Kim, for, I mean, what an innovative, I mean, this is really the beauty of, of, of academic medicine and, and, and the GFA to, to put together a podcast like this is so exciting and, and I think really critical to the kind of conversation that, that, that we were just talking about to, to, to build on, on what's said with every guest that you have to bring about positive change in, for our faculty and for our institutions and quite honestly for ourselves as well. And uh, so thank you for, for creating the show and for inviting me to be a guest. So well put. This has just been a great conversation. Friends, we've been listening to and learning from Dr. Amy Gottlieb, the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs, University of Massachusetts. Wow, aren't they lucky to have this person in their presence? And aren't we all? This was a great conversation. I learned so much. I'm sure you all did as well. Tune in next time to the Faculty Factory Podcast. Tell all your friends. Talk to you all later. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.